Thanks for tuning in to the NCAA Tournament Edition of the Proline Handicapping Show on the web. Coming up, Southern Illinois and Kansas in Thursday's action, as well as Friday's game between Vanderbilt and Georgetown. But first, a reminder that Jim's Tournament Dog of the Year is available completely free of charge when you call 1-877-JIM Feist. Jim's already nailed his Shocker and Tournament Games of the Year, so don't miss out. Make the call to 1-877-546-3347. And now, let's hear from our Proline panelists. It is Sweet 16 time. Welcome aboard to a special edition of Proline on the web. I'm Dave Cokin with Scott Spritzer and Glenn McGrew. We're going to talk some basketball, obviously, on this show, and uh, I will get to that in just a moment. I want to start you off by filling in on what's happening at rotoplay.com. Fantasy sports with attitude. You get daily contests where you can play and win every day. Exciting head-to-head action uh, where you can go uh, basically with a 50-50 shot to win, one and two possibility. You can challenge a friend, be paired automatically with another rotoplay member. Basketball, uh, the two-week frenzies are going on right now. All kinds of exciting stuff. Make sure you go to rotoplay.com and see how good you are as a general manager. We are in Las Vegas, and I'm going to tell you something. It's been a while since this town has been as upside down as it is right now. I, it, it's just tremendous excitement in this city. This is definitely a UNLV town, and the Rebels are in the Sweet 16. Amazing. Yeah, and, and what can we do to get Lon to stay? That's the next question. You know, it's, uh, it's going to be tough. I'm, I'm sitting there listening uh, to a, a show this morning, in fact, a national radio show, talking about Michigan, and uh, they asked if they've got any leads to where they're going to go as far as the head coach is concerned, and they said, well, we don't want to say anything because there's a prominent figure who's still coaching that we're waiting for until the season is well, over. You know that is. Was that before Tubby Smith was eliminated in Kentucky? Yeah. Let's well, hope I was going to say, you can always go for Tubby. You know, he can coach the heck out of you, but he can't recruit worth a darn, but you know, uh, boy, if Lon Kruger goes, it's right back down to the doldrums at UNLV. Well, unless I, I, I've got, I was just going to say, I've Reggie got the Theus would take job. Yeah. Uh, Reggie yeah. Theus would, would take exactly. this job. Yeah. Here's the thing on Lon Kruger. Uh, they like it here very, very much. Sure. Uh, I think that the boosters, and there are some very prominent boosters of this program, would come up with a, a very big offer. Uh, yeah, I don't want to mention any names, Steve Wynn, but what, what, uh, you know, yeah. well, in the Finleys, uh, whether it's enough to uh, keep on Kruger here, who knows? Uh, we'll wait and see. Uh, but the, the bottom line is the only thing UNLV cares about right now, and if you're a UNLV fan, the only thing you care about right now is, is uh, uh, duck hunting season. Uh, uh, duck hunting season is officially underway. Uh, and whether they can get past this very talented Oregon Duck squad, have to wait and see. That'll be Friday. It's just one of the... Great games mm-hmm. in the Sweet 16 round. There are eight terrific games. We're going to oh. look at a, at a couple of those games and talk about the different teams. And uh, notice the ratings, by the way, for this year's NCAA tournament, way up, up uh, double figures. Well, you know why not? Game. Because was, there's so many teams that have a chance. It it just draws the interest well, of the fans. Well, and, and, and also, uh, I think part of the problem with last year was yeah, George Mason was a great story and mm. and all the upsets, but. You know, let's face it, a lot of people's brackets got busted mm-hmm. in a hurry last year, and they didn't have as much interest mm, good point. as they would have had had their team still be, be alive. You've got seven of the top eight-seeded teams still in this tournament mm-hmm. right now. The only one gone is Wisconsin, courtesy of UNLV. What's the lowest seed still remaining, or the highest seed still remaining? Would it be what a number seven seed? seed? Oh, yeah, you mean the lowest seed. Yeah. Well, lowest, well, yeah. no, I think... Uh, no, it's uh, UNLV. 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 Just, just yeah, kind I mean, of a joke. You know, speaking yeah. of... One more thing about Kruger. Late in the game, I think they're up by four, uh, maybe a minute left or something like that. There's a timeout. Uh, he comes out, and I mean, you've got, you got people like Kruger, his son, of course, sure. and, and, and of course, White, the high score in this team. What do they do? They've got about... There's only like 12, 14 seconds left on the shot clock. What is Kruger? He comes out, and who has the ball? And go, who do they clear out one on one? Terry. And they designed the I play mean, at the time. Exactly. Out. Yeah. And they, they, he'd already beaten this guy off the off the dribble of three play game before. at the time. Yeah. But but that's just the that, that's exactly what Kruger can do in game coaching too. It isn't all about recruiting and preparing your sure. team for a game. It's what happens during the game. Well, too. and you see the senior leadership well, uh, coming to the forefront. I mean, uh, you know, let's face it. We, how many teams have we seen in the NCAA tournament over the years? The lower seeded team that makes a uh, <laughs> makes a big run. Uh, for, for 20, 25 minutes, then the, the higher seed takes over. Mm. And we saw that happen in the UNLV-Wisconsin game uh, where Wisconsin comes back and takes a 54-49 lead. That's the point of the game where the better team, the top high-seeded team, usually pulls away and gets not only the win but the cover. Uh, uh, instead, and UNLV goes off on a 16-3 run, and, and, and that's the game. Speaking of higher seeds, you know, I watched ESPN all day yesterday. Never once did I hear him say, the amazing story of the 
underdog Pac-10 coming out with three <laughs> teams left, almost four. I mean, Washington right. State's a double overtime away well, from, if, uh, Tony from being. That game. If Byers yeah, doesn't did. go nuts. In yeah, that and game, he just had you know. an unbelievable game. But, I mean, three. And the, uh, let's see, what did the ESPN say? The the second best conference, the Big Ten. I know they have one team remaining. And ACC has the one ACC team remaining. Well, all they're going to do is watch us for that? the past six well, months again. Yeah. There's one guy you can learn from on ESPN, folks. I, I, this isn't, I'm not taking a shot at any, against anybody. The bottom line is there's one guy you can learn from because he tells it like it is and he knows the game as well as anybody I've ever heard in my 40 years of watching basketball, and that's Rick Majerus. Oh, he's sharp. I mean, you can listen to him, and you're going to learn something almost oh, every time you listen and, to him, and you're going to get a solid opinion. But I'm going to tell you what, this whole thing about the – they just blow away the Pac-10, blow it off like well, it's they don't nothing. know. Mm. Well, and again, that's their fault. Yeah. And you say it's – well, hold on a second, Dave, because you like to say that, and, and I know you mean this the right way, that – they have to follow so many teams. Well, that's their job. Mm. And they're not worried about winning and losing. They're not jumping into it like no. angles, like handicappers and guys like us do. It, they don't follow it. Let's just admit it. They look at the big ACC. They look at whatever's on their network. Right. Mm. Which the Pac-10 is. And the Pac-10 isn't. The Mountain West isn't. The WAC isn't. And if you want to know the best basketball that's played, go to a handicapper. Because the handicapper's top 25, which used to be in play up until a few years ago on the Internet, was the best top 25 you're going to find the, anywhere. The two best conferences uh, going in are the two best conferences. Sure. Which is the Pac-10 and the SEC. Well, the I don't know about the, the – you're right. The, they, they have three left. I, I still think the Big East was, was the second best. Well, I, I thought the, best, the SEC was better than the Big East. Did you? Well, yeah. It's they've, a, got, they've got the best team. Well, they've got three. There's three and two left. So I guess you could argue the case. Uh, although the, the one team that I if – I was, if I was every other team, the one team I feared the most – was Louisville. I really thought that this team had enough. That they, and, of course, they just ran into it in a better ball well, club in, in Texas A&M. But, yeah. uh, but that was, uh, if, if that hadn't happened, they'd have had the three instead of two teams left in the, uh, left in the tournament. But uh, uh, it, it's, hard to, it's hard to Well, here's the difference. To really here's, say yeah. one way, who is the here's best. The but, but to totally leave out the Pac-10 right, like it's, it's they ridiculous. did is just. Well, it's been great. I've loved it because well, we have sure. snuck under the, under the radar, so to speak. With all, I mean, we had USC. We called it our mismatch over Texas because we knew it was a mismatch, especially in the backcourt. You've got USC guards, four guys who get legitimate playing time that goes 6'4", 6'4", 6'5", 6'5". They've got a tweener at 6'6". They've got Taj Gibson at 6'9", who can take guys off the wing. Mm -hmm. uh, going up against a Texas team that had two guards under six feet tall in Augustine and Abrams, you've got two underclassmen. You've got an Augustine who is going to be a great player, but right now tends to turn the ball over against good competition, and he had six turnovers in that game. I mean, it, it's been great. UCLA was undervalued, believe it or not, in their opener. Uh, USC has been undervalued twice. I mean, right down the line. So uh, is Oregon. So is Oregon. Oregon was I used my, Oregon against Winthrop they, as a big play, Oregon was you know? my best bet against Winthrop. I absolutely love the game. Uh, uh, Oregon basically laying the same number as Notre Dame did. Exactly. I'm going to tell you, Oregon is absolutely <laughs> flat out better than Notre Dame. And... Uh, uh, I thought that was an easy. Well, you know, I thought it was an easy bet. You know why we had Oregon as our second round game of the year then? Because we just thought that was an unbelievable matchup in line when we saw three and a half on the Oregon Ducks over Winthrop, a Winthrop squad, who people have got to watch. I mean, that bench went from nine deep to six deep basically against Notre Dame. And they can't make a free Shorten throw. Shorten the bench, can't make a free throw, and the, you know, Bradshaw underneath, who's a good player, his points and his looks and his touches are predicated by perimeter shooting. What does Oregon do best? Attack the perimeter mm -hmm. on defense. So it, Oregon, Oregon, is, little Oregon guard, is one of little the guard. What's his name? The five six guy uh, for Oregon. Uh, the Porter. Guard. Porter. Well, he's a holy terror. Yeah, yeah uh, he really is uh, against these teams. It's yeah. you know the one common denominator too. You look at these final sixteen teams and uh, ten of them in particular. You can look at and say, wow, what, what is the one thing they do best in its defense? Out of the Pac-10, Oregon isn't quite there. But you look at UCLA uh, and USC, two tremendously uh, talented defensive teams. UNLV, let's face it, uh, not, not that they don't do other things, but, I mean, they're a great defensive team. Texas A&M, uh, all the ball clubs that are left, most of them, that's the big key, I think. When you look at tournament play, you're always going to have a game or two. What do you play, five? What are you going to win, five six. games? Six. Six games. You're going to, out of six, a half dozen games, you're going to have a night or two where you, the shot isn't falling. It comes down to you can always win with your defense, though. You know The teams that are left are teams that never give up. I mean, UNLV, mm -hmm. their one thing that makes them equal to some of the teams they're going to be playing against in a tournament like this is their drive, their desire. Mm -hmm. I mean, they never lose focus on the defensive end of the court. I mean, Lon Kruger can go 0 for 8 in round 1. They can be playing against a team that's towering over them, that's getting second-chance shots. But because of their defensive play and their heart and their desire, and they're just so well-coached,
they can overcome some of those mistakes. If, if you don't mention the name UNLV, you could substitute that for the Salukis, another team that just, I mean, so tuck. Tenacious oh, on defense. They've given, oh, well, they've given up 49 That's, and 50 points. I mean, so Virginia you, Tech. I mean, what's the great uh, Dowdell? Yeah, great. I mean, first team, what, ACC, I, I, seven I, points. I, I don't know who you guys played in that game. I'm going to take a wild guess and say Southern Illinois, the Southern Illinois Virginia Tech game. No, what? I had the I had the over, but I lost. So Did you, okay, yeah. I had Southern Illinois. And, what and was I looked, the total in the, uh, on the 119. 119. I looked at it and said, look, there's there's just no. I, and this is having seen these ACC teams all year. And knowing that most people haven't seen the Missouri Valley Conference teams all year, it's like, Virginia Tech hasn't seen a defense like this all year. No. They're not going to be able to handle that kind of heat. And, and, and they didn't. They wilted eventually in the second half. They hung in for a while. And then Southern Illinois hit them mm -hmm. uh, and started, that's twice the started making Southern a few Illinois shots. Beaten them. Yeah. They beat them 69-64 back in late November. And they said, oh, well, we're going to pound you again. You know, big brother, little brother. Southern Illinois they're one more but they're better score, defensively that's a now. Scary oh, they are. Yeah. And, and, the, and the flip side of it is, you know, you get certain opinions about coaches over the years. And, and I'm not trying to make myself sound like a genius at this or anything, but uh, has Seth Greenberg ever won a really big game? Mm. Really? Yeah, I, they just, it's just you go back to his days uh, at, at other schools, and it, it's just he's not a big game winner. Mm. I think he's, he's one of those guys who's a good coach. Sure. But when he gets up against the cream of the crop, he mm. just can't push it to the next level. And, and if you look at the coaches that are alive in this thing right now, you're talking about a who's who. A college mm. basketball coaches, the best guys in the business. No doubt about are still it. Still coaching this tournament. Seth right Greenberg, now. the thing about him, he did a great, a great job at Long Beach. You know, getting that program. Has he ever up had level. like what you'd call one of the talented teams, though? I mean, he's never really had one of the elite squads talent wise. He's always, you know what? With. He's like the Marty Schottenheimer almost of, of college basketball <laughs> because he wins wherever he goes. He's yeah. a twenty game a season winner. He's very but good at building programs. Yeah, he can't get level. over the top. As Davis said, he just doesn't win the big games. When he's at USF, I don't think he had the funds. No to uh, be able to build a program. But I think Virginia Tech is always going to be near 22 wins a season, mm -hmm. and they're probably going to falter when it comes tournament time in the second round. It, it's just what happens. And his teams always <coughs> seem to go in lulls for I, long stretches. It, it's kind of like um, if you want to talk about a coach who's been doing it longer, Tom Penders sure. mm -hmm. would fall into that category. I don't care where Penders mm -hmm. goes. His programs are always going to be decent. Mm -hmm. But except for that one run that he had at URI uh, where they made it to the grade eight, right. um, he, that's the kind of guy – Coach Penders has been yep. over the years. Mm. Act, it, it, that's not a knock on him, because he can he can go anywhere. I, you could put him in Oshkosh University if there's <laughs> such a place, and he'd find a way to get them to be a good program, just not great. You know what the the least What's best funny, program is right now mm. is Kentucky. I mean, here's a school. Gosh, when Rick Pitino left, was head and shoulders above everybody else. Oh. And the Kentucky Wildcats. I mean, we Peter Principal, Tubby Smith is not getting it done. He's a I'm tough sorry. Fit. You know well, what? That's a, I mean, you look at the the the, the, the elite programs. There's five, six, Kentucky seven of them in the nation, the and it's yeah. good. Yeah. 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 I think Tubby can game coach with anybody. Oh, so do I. He's not. He's he not. I'm gonna tell you, he's not a good recruiter. No, he, mm. he's obviously not. If you watch that game against Kansas, that was night and day, one program ahead of yeah. the other. And, and I, I, I still game. consider Kentucky to be a top 20 program, which shows you oh, how sure. well Bill Self has done, and it shows you the difference between one of the elite four or five compared to one of the teams that are maybe 16 to 20, you know, as far as sure. programs are concerned. But, you know, I don't blame the people in Kentucky uh, for w really looking elsewhere right now because if they want to be satisfied winning 20 to 23 games a season, keep Tubby. I really that program should say, be playing for national you titles. You shouldn't be talking like that, though, because basically what you're doing is you're convincing Michigan not to go after Tubby and instead look elsewhere, maybe somewhere towards Well, see, the I think West. Tubby would win plenty of championships in Michigan. Yeah, <laughs> don't you? Yeah. <laughs> he would be a great fit, wouldn't he? It's, it's funny when people talk about coaches, and, and they forget that recruiting is a really big part. Yeah, that's, that's part, of, a part of the yeah. coaching. Now, now they, may, they may be better game coaches mm -hmm. than Roy Williams, or Mike Krzyzewski. But when I hear people come on the air and say, ah, Mike Krzyzewski, you know, overbearing, can't coach. Are you kidding? That's ridiculous. Yeah. Absolutely. That's a stu any, I'm going to tell you this. And there's a prominent guy in this town who's got a reputation for being uh, very knowledgeable about college basketball. Not a sports service guy. <laughs> and he thinks Mike Krzyzewski's a terrible coach. I'm going to tell you something. He hasn't the slightest idea what he's talking about. Mike Krzyzewski has been in seven championship games he's also he's won three yeah. national titles but what he's a recruiter. arguably as good a recruiter as you'll ever find that guy you're talking about i don't think he's hit 50 percent in any of the last three yeah. years and keep saying he's gonna hang it up know, at the end of this year so uh, uh but <laughs> mike Krzyzewski's a great coach he may not be the best game coach but when you uh, in everything that's encompassed in coaching include all that he's a great coach he's sure. one of the all-time greats so is roy williams 
There may be I, there may be better game individual game coaches than Roy Williams who can run better stuff uh, in a game. But when you bring in the recruiting aspect of it, that's a huge part of coaching. There's nobody better. Mm -hmm. He's as good as it gets. Uh, and, and if you look at the coaches that are still in this tournament right now, I mean, it's one after another mm -hmm. after another. Either guys that are already at the top of the of the marquee, or are on their way to the top of the marquee, or at least have been there. Lon Kruger certainly mm -hmm. fits that bill. Lon Kruger said four different teams now that he's taken to the NCAA tournament. He's won big everywhere he's been. Sure. Guy's a great basketball coach. You'd never know it looking at some of our newspapers here, though, with the people that write in. Well, our local radio oh, shows. The first year he was here said he was the biggest mistake hire of oh, all. You know, and those guys are still have they still have shows on the air in Las Vegas. They've never come not out and said them. we were wrong. No, not you. They still no. have come out and said never said we were wrong. Now they're bandwagon jumping. I was catching Las more. Vegas radio is small you, market high school yeah, radio. Is. If I've ever heard of it, I, I was sorry. catching more heat last year. <laughs> I'm getting emails every day, and I do a local show on ESPN Radio 920 here in Las Vegas. Uh, uh, and uh, it's a mainstream show. It's not a, a sports gaming show. Uh, so obviously this is one of the discussions that will be taking place. Good coach, bad coach. Kruger's getting ripped last year uh, by the locals. They, there's a firelinekruger.com mm -hmm. website. And they go, oh, we got to go out and get Bob Huggins, um, uh, who, by the way, had said that he didn't want to coach out west anyway. So, mm -hmm. But that, I guess, was a moot point. Uh, and I, I'm getting trashed. I'm getting emails mm -hmm. all over the place because I think it's Lon Kruger. Mm -hmm. This guy's a great coach. Uh, 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 they, they, all right, they had a 17-win season, didn't make it to the NIT. That's all right. They're going to get better. I didn't expect yeah. them to get this good. I'm not, uh, I'm not Kreskin, okay? I did, <laughs> I did not think they'd be going to the Sweet 16 before this season no. started. But I knew Lon Kruger was going to win with this team eventually. It, and yet the letters keep pouring into the Las Vegas <laughs> Review Journal. They haven't played anybody. Uh, uh, what? Most people don't know what they're talking about. Right. I don't mean that to sound like I'm smug or, or that I know more than everybody else. But I do this for a living, and I do more, know more than most people. And I can tell you right now, if you didn't think Lon Kruger was a good coach, well, and if you don't think Roy Williams is a good coach, and if you don't think Mike Krzyzewski is a good coach, you don't know what you're talking about. Can I, can I just be really bluntly honest here, and I'll probably get ripped all over town for this? Las Vegas is not the greatest sports town. Let's <laughs> just call it like no. it is. The fans are not the most knowledgeable. They're, they're good fans, but... They loved Roly Massimino's hire. <laughs> and back when, I, when he got hired, I know just like John Robinson, and back when they both got hired, we said, oh, my gosh, talk about stealing a paycheck. Now, see, I, I disagree and, with and, John and Roley, Well, of course you do, because you, did re you like John as a person. Yeah, I, do I don't. Like John. I, that's fine. I look at him as a coach. Uh, Roly Massimino, when he got here, destroyed the program. Absolutely oh, I, I, I broke it that, down yeah. from being a premier program to being a joke. Well, Roly was then, also And then a, Robinson yeah. came along, and the first year, he had energy, hmm. coached well. Look to be getting some good people to come in, and then he quit coaching. He just quit after probably the a second season year and they a half. Got to a bowl game. Well, the, he quit. He quit coaching. I don't care what you say. No, after that, uh, they had one good. They good. had one great receiver. What's his name? Turner. That was here. That yeah. made the kid, the quarterback, uh, the transfer from Southern Cal back then uh, look fantastic. Yeah, Nate was a great route runner. Nate Turner, and he, yeah. in fact, he got he went into the pros. He was on San Diego's yeah, roster for a couple yeah. seasons. But the bottom line was, he made that offense. Uh, we mm -hmm. played a very weak schedule. Thomas threw the ball up, looked like a punt, and Turner made him look spectacular. When Turner left, Thomas became the quarterback that he was. And it's unfortunate, but he wasn't a good quarterback. No, I, I, and especially in second I, I half. You went to a lot of games out there in the second half. I mean, you could actually look down at Robinson and see it. he oh. wasn't even in the I, game. I, I would, I would, in every game the last two years he was here. I, I would, out, that I would agree with. Out prepared every John game. John yeah. just basically ran out of gas. His wife stole was a paycheck. Not, yeah. wife yeah. wasn't doing well physically. Not that he didn't have the knowledge. Just stole a paycheck. Yeah. Yeah. No. I was, well, well, there's one There's one ex. On a real side note here, there's one ex NFLer who played about an 11 or 12-year career and we won't mention any names, but we all know him. Uh, he came out and told me, you can't ever say that I said this, but you can say this, that an ex-NFLer who worked with John Robinson as both a player and did some coaching with him knows that John Robinson was the biggest cheerleader, was a real good recruiter, didn't know crock about X's and O's. I'm just telling you from an ex-NFLer who liked him and worked with him as both a player and a coach. So. The uh, Raleigh Massimino thing, by the way, the biggest problem with... with Raleigh is not, Raleigh was a good basketball coach. I mean, he, he knew what he was doing. He, he did some great things at Villanova. But he was never very good with the media. And it was horrible and, when the shot clock came into play, by the well, way. <laughs> and whoever took the job here in Las Vegas because of the fallout from the talk years was going to have to deal with the media a lot. Mm -hmm. And if it didn't go well, Raleigh was the worst possible person 
uh, to have on the scene. Uh, he has never been one who handles adversity well with the media. That goes back to his Philadelphia days. This was a party for Rolly when he came here. This was Tommy Liz Horta coming to town every other night. They were going out to dinners. No, it was a disaster. Um, they weren't preparing for teams. They did well the first year when he had Tark's players left over. Uh, but anyway, back to the tournament. You're right. When it comes to coaching, the teams that are left have premier coaches yeah. up and down this roster of 16 teams. What I've liked about the tournament is the fact that this was one of those seasons when a lot of the general public was jumping on teams like Wright State and Winthrop and looking for that Cinderella because of what George Mason did last year. And I think that really gave us public numbers with a lot of these teams. Well, Again, we did have one Winthrop. Cinderella and they let it get away <clears throat> for the strangest set of circumstances, which was Xavier. Mm -hmm. Xavier, Xavier should have beaten Ohio State. Yeah. And isn't it weird how matchups dictate results sometimes? Um, uh, Miller did an absolutely great job coming up with an offense to attack Ohio State with Odin on the court. Uh, he kept on running the same. If you watch that game, he kept on running the same thing over and over again in the second half, which was sc uh, uh, screens, all kinds of screens on mm -hmm. the right side of the court to bring Odom uh, away from the paint. And it worked tremendously well. <laughs> what happened was they didn't have any offensive sets when Odin fouled out. Mm -hmm. Ohio State actually became a better team sure. in that game when Odin For that out. one game. Mm -hmm. Their individual talent yeah. took over, mm -hmm. and it and, worked. And, and <laughs> everything Xavier had done to prepare right. was, done. was with yeah. Odin in mind. Mm -hmm. And when he wasn't there, they, they went to a much quicker lineup. They went to almost a playground type <laughs> of uh, yeah. it approach was also. But yeah, they did. the bottom line is Xavier was at the free throw line with a three-point lead with six seconds yeah. left and yeah, missed a free throw. Yep. That's right. He Make makes the free throw game over. Now, game. that was a huge play for me, Xavier, plus seven and a half. So I know, I went, how, when he made that 35 foot up, going, oh, the oh my gosh, and then the lift at the end of the game, I jumped out of my seat, which was nice. By the way, <laughs> never should have happened. Xavier committed a, they were a, a offensive foul that I don't know how they missed it right before the winning, the right. spread covering layup in overtime. And I've got Xavier too, sure. plus seven and a half. So it's like, a thank you for swallowing the whistle, mm -hmm. Mr. Referee. The mm. Xavier guy goes boom like that, knocks an Ohio State guy out of bounds, and then lays it in. It's like, oh my God! That's the that. ultimate <laughs> let him play yeah. game, right? Not you mentioned you, you mentioned coaches. <laughs> Let's face it. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but if I'm going to look, if I'm going to look for a, a possible national champion uh, team, there are really four categories. And the first one for me is you got to have a good point guard, especially when you get into the into the tournament, because we were just mm -hmm. discussing defense. Let's face it, if you're up against better defenses, you've got to have a guy that's got to be able to lead your mm -hmm. team and, and and direct against defenses. Number two is teams that play real good defense. Third, a really good head coach, a guy who's been around and knows what he's doing. Fourth, maybe senior leadership. You want to have an mm -hmm. experienced squad, although Florida last year showed you that that isn't that isn't a, of those fourth categories. That's certainly not the most important since they did it without any you know without any any seniors, but uh, uh, most of these teams, uh, you were just talking about head coaching, but I, uh, I really like teams with, with point guards. And don't fall in love and say that the team that wins a national champion has to be one of these teams that holds teams to 60 points a game. No. Because again, like I said, the prerequisites, 16 of the last 17 that, champions, yes. one, of, one of those prerequisites is you've got to average over 76 points a game. So you play tenacious D, but winning 77 to 69 are teams that are doing better in the tournament or 7767 7, than teams that win 60 That's 55. why Southern Illinois can only go so far. Exactly. They're, oh, great, sure. they're, they're a great story. They've done a tr tremendous job in the air. As, as good a defensive team as I've ever seen, but offensively they are a little bit they limited. They, 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 yeah. they, they have games where they don't <laughs> shoot the ball well at all. We're going to talk about them in a minute yep. here, aren't we? Yeah. yeah. In fact, we'll uh, step away and take a little bit of a break. We'll come back and uh, look at the Salukis game uh, uh, next on ProLine. Up next, the Southern Illinois Salukis battle the Kansas Jayhawks. Plus, Glenn McGrew has a special four-day, four-sport offer, and Dave Koken's tournament game of the year and under-the-hat winners are also being made available completely free of charge. Okay, we got the Salukis and the Jayhawks coming up in just a second. First, I want to talk about primetime sports in general. Winning continued this past weekend. You know, you go back the last 18 days, starting with the conference tourneys, and then, of course, now the big dance going here. Rock solid, 46 and 30 the last 18 days. Then you go to the NBA. I'm up 52 stars since March 3rd for the season. Since week one, it's just been terrific. The NHL, everybody forgets about it. 35 stars the last eight days. And we got arena football, of course. The, the foot's here. Uh, 32 units up so far after three weeks of play. I'm going to take advantage of all those sports. I'm going to give you a four-day package, and this is for only ProLine listeners only. Four full days of free action in all four sports. You're going to get all of my pro hoops. You're going to get all my tournament college hoops. 
my NHL plays, and my arena football. It's all free. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, all in the house. 1-800-531-7069. Be sure and give me a call. Now, uh, this underdog Saluki team, great defense, but they have a shot against, I mean, what an athletically uh, gifted, gifted team in Kansas, huh? Ooh. Yeah, and, and they're just deep, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, Kansas is loaded. Uh, uh, Bill Self has uh, gotten the, the bad stuff out of the way now from the last couple mm -hmm. of years with the early eliminations, and uh, uh, boy, they really outplayed Kentucky. Well, Scott, didn't you say, didn't you, I mean, you were saying a couple of weeks ago, you thought that talent-wise, they might be the best team in the country. Yeah, so, I, yeah. I felt, you know, I, I don't know, I, I felt that in looking at brackets, that whoever won, I think, would be the Elite Eight matchup if they get there would be mm. Kansas against UCLA. I really felt the winner of that Elite Eight matchup would go on to win the national championship. Now, if that happens, then UCLA doesn't fall into one of those angles of the 16 of the last 17 national champions, but Kansas definitely does. Uh, Russell Robinson, here's the storyline going into the tournament. They said, well, he's got the bad toe. 11 to 1 assist to turnover ratio <laughs> two games later. I mean, the team's just unbelievable. The wave of talent that you said that comes off this bench. What I would like to say about Southern Illinois, have you guys seen two other teams in the last, let's say, 15 years, other than UNLV and Southern Illinois, that, that just focuses on defensive intensity oh, for a solid 40 minutes like SIU and UNLV <clears throat> does? I mean, you had the 40 minutes of hell with Nolan Richardson, which could almost equate to this. You had Tark when he was at UNLV, whose defense was underrated and was so solid on that end of the court. You know what Southern Illinois does in practice? This is great. Uh, their head coach, Chris Lowry, who's one of the best young coaches in the United States. I mean, this guy, if somebody doesn't come in there and take him out oh, of Carbondale I mean, and give him a big contract yeah. mm -hmm. soon, they're absolutely crazy. But what they do in practice, I've never heard of this before. They, don't, they have a, a section of practice where they go for over a half hour where there are no fouls, no, no holds barred, almost like a wrestling event, and there are no out of bounds. <laughs> you just keep playing no matter what happens because he wants to develop a culture of no whining. Get out there. I don't care if you get smacked, if you get hit, if you get scraped, if you get knocked on your teeth, if the ball is three rows deep in the, in, the, in the stands, everything is fair game. That's what they do for over 30 minutes a day in practice, and look what it's done for this program. Well, I mean, when, they're incredible. When the Salukis, I mean, more than one player, I've heard them say to, uh, to a reporter, this tournament stuff doesn't bother us because our practices are so much they're harder grueling. than, yeah. yeah. And the, I tell you, Lowry really, he's done for this program I think what uh, the current UCLA coach, Ben Howland, did at Pittsburgh, sure. turned them into just the best team year after year. There was about a three-year three, three stretch where the Pitt Panthers were the best team in the nation when it came to defense. What's and, amazing uh, about SIU yeah. is they keep doing it. They have Weber they before have. this. They always have a coach who comes in. I mean, whoever's doing the hiring there is doing a fantastic job. Uh, as far as this game is concerned, if I'm, you know, Bill Self, which... I might know spreads better than self. I think he knows how to coach a little bit better than I do. If you're but yourself. The bottom line is, yeah, if I'm yeah. myself. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, what they ought to do, I think, on paper is take Russell Robinson, take the deepness of Kansas, and drive right at Falker and right yeah. at uh, Tatum. Try to draw foul trouble early because they will play in your shirt defense. Mm -hmm. And the talent that Kansas has in the backcourt can really take it out of them and make these guys maybe play defense by reaching out a little bit and which could get them in foul trouble, which changes their well, game. you got to get ahead of them. Without, get without, get without ahead Jamal Tatum, though, I mean, really, this team doesn't have what you call a, you know, a, a, a big-time scorer. That's, that's sure. their other problem. So, I mean, if you, if you, if you limit him and, or if he gets into foul trouble, it really, uh, it really creates a problem for him. Faulkner's a nice inside man, but, I mean, let's say, uh, you know, you want to have at least two real scores on a team to make it more difficult for defenses. And, unfortunately, well, they for that. the Salukis, they but, don't but have that. But the thing is, I, I, you know, Kansas has got to make sure they get off to a quick start in this game. Mm. Because if this is one of those games that's three, four points either way at the half, mm -hmm. it's going to stay that way. Yeah, yeah, sure. It's going to be a struggle for them the whole game. Uh, uh, they, they need to get out and, and just get hot early and hit some shots right out at, at the outset and try and take Southern Illinois out of their, their comfort zone. And if you can do that, then you got them. If mm -hmm. you can't, then they are going to have 40 minutes of hell and, uh, and, and, and yeah. may lose. And and it's picking. always the case, you know, the, the, the further a, a dog gets, and especially one as tenacious on defense as the Lugies, the further that game gets, stays well, the close. Thing is, the, yeah, more. the thing is that, that other teams can shoot their way back into games. Difficult That's the one thing Southern Illinois probably yeah. can't do. I mean, uh, uh, I saw the Missouri Valley Conference yeah. uh, finals with mm -hmm. Creighton, where Creighton got the jump on them, right. and they could not shoot their way yeah. back in the game, and that was against Creighton, uh, uh, which is a good program, and it's not Kansas. So, uh, to me... Uh, uh, this is one of those games where you, you may be able to get a good second-half wager 
Sure. Uh, if you're paying attention in the first half. And, and, you know, if you look at what they did against Virginia Tech, if Southern Illinois goes 12 for 21 from area code three again, oh, then I'll be oh, the well, most shocked that. person in America. So that's the bottom line. If you get ahead of Southern Illinois, let's say if Kansas is up by eight points at halftime, it's going to be incredibly difficult for Southern Illinois not to lose by, you know, less than a dozen points if they're right. down by eight at the break. But, of course, you're getting big points. So I think if the line's are around eight and yeah. a half right now. Yeah. It may that's go up another point. That's about something. what my number is. Yeah. I made my number. In fact, I've got to jot it jotted down here. I have it... Uh, uh, my number in the game is uh, 7.8 mm -hmm. uh, for yeah. Kansas, so it's right around where the number is. The thing is with Kansas, and this is totally nitpicking, obviously, with the Kansas Jayhawks, but trying to look for weaknesses. Uh, one of the things they do at times during the season, they may, haven't done it yet in the tournament, <clears throat> is once in a while they get hurried on offense, and they don't take care of the ball. They start to um, – I know they're not playing to do the, make the spectacular dunk or the spectacular Lord, play. They're just so good. But it almost looks as though that's what they're trying to do. But it's because they're so skilled and athletic. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is they do get hurried once in a while on the offensive end of the court. Now, if they're in a tussle down the stretch, the final six or seven minutes, and this is anybody's game, it's a two- to three-point game either way, that might come into play. But, again, that is nitpicking. And, and also, I mean, they're, they're shooting 66.7%. Not horrific but still not good for, for what you'd consider one of the best the teams line. in the country, yeah. which could get them in a little trouble. All right, let me tell you what I've got going uh, over the weekend, uh, or at least the Thursday and Friday. I can't predict Saturday and Sunday yet because I don't know who's playing. But uh, <laughs> Oh, come on. Give it a shot. I've got hopes as to who's playing, <laughs> I can tell you that. Uh, just an absolutely amazing tournament run that I've had. In fact, I'm picking 66% against the line on every game in the tournament, uh, which is pretty amazing. My top... Level plays are perfect. Uh, they've all won 100% uh, in this uh, NCAA tournament. I've got my tournament game of the year coming up on Thursday. I'm going to give you all my under-the-hat plays Thursday and Friday, including that tournament game of the year, which by itself is going to be sold for 50 bucks online. Uh, it's all free. Make sure and call the number as soon as possible to get registered for this. 1-800-547-4224. Everything's going real well right now. In fact, the Arena Football League... It's almost a joke as to how well uh, that league's going. Uh, uh, but the concentration, obviously, is on the basketball tournament right now. That's where you want to win this week because those are the games you're going to be watching. 1-800-547-4224. Tournament game of the year on Thursday, and you'll get all my under-the-hat plays Thursday and Friday. We're going to come back and look at another game when ProLine continues. Coming up, Friday's battle between Vanderbilt and Georgetown. Plus, Scott Spritzer's continuing his red-hot run by releasing his round of 16 game of the year. And world champion handicapper Jim Feist is making available his tournament dog of the year absolutely free of charge. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, last week, we talked about an eight-week run that we had been on at Smash Mouth Sports, our best run ever in college basketball that had produced over 400 stars of profit. Well, guess what? It's now a nine-week run. 69.4% winners in college basketball in the big dance. 155 stars of profit Thursday through Sunday in the big dance. And we hit every one of our high-end plays. We swept our main events. We won our first round game of the year with the Pittsburgh Panthers, who annihilated Wright State. Came back and won our second round game of the year with the Oregon Ducks, who annihilated Winthrop. And it's just been one win after another. Our mismatch, our big dance mismatch, was just that with an underdog, USC, who pounded Texas into submission by 19. 155 stars of profit in four days. If that sounds good to you, then you want to make the call to Smash Mouth Sports today, toll free. 1-800-521-1872. The Sweet 16 is free on me at Smash Mouth Sports. It includes my Sweet 16 game of the year as we like to go to 3-0 with games of the year in the big dance. Again, 1-800-521-1872. Now we talk about Vandy and Georgetown line roughly at this point. Georgetown laying about seven and a half. Total about a buck thirty-one, guys. Yeah, my number in the game has uh, uh, Georgetown six, so there's not really great edges to be found uh, on numbers at this point. And I'm looking for matchups uh, to to come up with my plays. Uh, uh, Vanderbilt, uh, these, these SEC, te SEC teams are live. Uh, Georgetown's a terrific basketball team, but I'm going to tell you something. They they uh, they're not as deep as I thought they were. Um, when they get into their bench, they can, they can get caught up to, let's put it that way. We saw that with Boston College, mm -hmm. uh, which Georgetown's regulars just dominated them early. I mean, this game's 12-2, to two, boom, mm -hmm. like that. And it looks like Boston College has no prayer in this basketball game. Turned out to be a heck of a game, and, and was closer than the seven-point final margin uh, would indicate. That was a game that really went to the wire. Um, and, and Georgetown's depth wasn't apparent in that game. It'll be interesting to see how Vanderbilt attacks them. Uh, uh, 
uh, coming up in this Friday contest. Like they attack every, they have this incredible mismatch on the perimeter. Byers and Foster go six seven They're and big. six six. Unless they play Arkansas. Unless, <laughs> <laughs> boy, we both think about that home game and talk. And that was at home where this this team never never shoots poorly. Boy, Weird they game. did in that game, didn't Weird. they? But anyway, it it really does. I mean, that that's a problem for any team. To go to, when you've got two guys that shoot from a perimeter that size, six seven and six six, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Byers especially just had an incredible, incredible game in the second round. Uh, it's going to be tough for Georgetown, but uh, I'll tell you, they have so much size. Uh, I don't like this. Is another team I mentioned, Kansas. Uh, this is another team, Georgetown, though, that doesn't shoot free throws real well. Uh, and, and, and then yeah. the other thing, you know, you always think of Georgetown. The first thing I think of is bricklayers from outside. Mm -hmm. Not as bad as, as some of those John Thompson teams, but they're still. Uh, teams that play a real aggressive, tough zone can give them a problem. You, I tell you one thing: you better attack Vanderbilt. Sure. Oh yeah. You really have to now, and we saw in the Western. Well, State Green game, will do that. There's no uh, doubt about that. So. Well, you, you got to keep it keep it going too. Mm -hmm. The Washington State game. I, I had Vanderbilt in that game, and to be honest with you, I think I was lucky to win. Uh, even though they were the dog and they won in, in overtime, double overtime. If Tony Bennett doesn't. Tony, I thought Tony Bennett blew the game. I thought Tony Bennett blew the game. I was watching the game, and I'm going, I got the wrong side in this mm. game. Washington State's attacking, 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 and there's nothing Vanderbilt can do. Uh, they're up seven, nine points. I mean, it's a mm. solid Washington State performance. He started playing the game not to lose. When he got ahead comfortably in 10 minutes to go, started milking the clock and got him out of their offense. He wasn't aggressive. He became his dad. And Van, and, <laughs> yep, yep, he, morphed. he did. He morphed. And Vanderbilt took Nothing over, more. absolutely took over the game at that point. And you knew going yeah. into overtime, if you're a Washington State backer, you're going to have to get real yeah. lucky to win the game. Somebody's going to have to go off from three-point land sure. because Vanderbilt, at that point, was the, clearly the better basketball team. Georgetown has to look at that film. Mm -hmm. John Thompson III has to look at that film and say, wow, I, I've, got, I've got to – attack this team 40 minutes offensively mm -hmm. otherwise I'm, I'm, I'm gonna let them beat me and, and it's gonna be very interesting to see if he does that because I don't know yet if if this John Thompson has the killer instinct his dad did mm -hmm. his dad oh boy when he had you forget about it you well, that's different but that's interesting that's right Vandy's playing two straight weeks against a team coached by a son who replaced a father right but uh, and, and, and in this case Georgetown fans that better hope that that there's a third has the same killer instinct tendencies that his dad had didn't work in Washington State and that's why the, the Cougars aren't playing anymore. I'm sitting there on Saturday and, and we were off to a 3-0 and start. We had, you know, watched Xavier uh, goof up an outright victory over Ohio State and then get fortunate to get the cover for us. And we had Butler as our underdog shocker uh, in the tournament in the first two rounds. We had Butler uh, over Maryland. So we're sitting there and we're in 3-0 and and we've got Washington State. And I got to tell you, I was feeling great. We had a hammer play on Washington State. And I was watching the first half of that game, and we're with, I'm with a group of people, and we're eating, we're having a good time, and I'm going, oh, man, they're just do, having their way with the Vanderbilt Commodores. And then, as you said, at about 10 minutes to go, Dick Bennett showed up on the bench. As much as I like <laughs> Dick Bennett, but they slowed it down to like Dick Bennett used to do instead of his kid Tony Bennett. And then Derek Byers just went oh, nuts. Just took over. I mean, just an incredible Boy, game. Took over the final six, seven minutes of that game. Um, kind of a little bit upset with Vanderbilt because they cost me my overall game of the year a few weeks ago when they shot 30% at home against Arkansas. <clears throat> we eked out a win with Vandy in the SEC tourney in their game against Arkansas. And then, of course, they beat me on Saturday against Washington State. So I'm a little leery about jumping you're in on Vanderbilt two. games yeah, right two. now. Yeah. But Sapp and Wallace, here's the thing about Georgetown. They really got to come up big. They cannot get into foul trouble because other than Sapp and Wallace, as you kind of mentioned, they're not deep no. at the guard positions. And this is one of those situations where I know Vanderbilt's game is to shoot the three. But, man, I'd like to see Green and maybe see some guys driving a little bit because you'd love to be able to get a foul or two early on the Georgetown backcourt and make them change their game plan a little bit because without Sepp and Wallace, they don't have the same direction. I, it's I think it's a tough game to call, and you hit it on the head think, when it comes to these kind that, of numbers. Uh, you think Thompson's going to uh, uh, alter the defensive strategy a little bit to get Hibbert out? On, uh, out on the block, yeah. uh, outside of the paint a little bit because he's got, he, he's got to go out there and, and interfere with some of those three-point shots. Yeah, you got at a six-seven guy can think about from twenty-eight feet yeah. away. Yeah. So you, you know, got to, but you can't get him in foul trouble. That's the one thing. But I think I, just my last point of the game, you hit it on the head when it comes to laying seven, eight, nine points, especially at this juncture of the tournament. And you're talking about teams that can't shoot free throws. There's nothing worse than having an eleven-point lead with a minute to go and watching your team clank 
every other free yeah. throw they shoot and win by six or seven. So you got to be careful of that also. After saying why Georgetown could have a problem, just like a lot of teams, this matchup because of the size of those two guys shooting them from the perimeter. I've watched a lot of Georgetown games this year where they have where their guards have their biggest problem is against these really small, super quick backcourts like a team like mm -hmm. Oregon. Well, we just give them fits, I think. Uh, fortunately for them in that respect, uh, Vanderbilt doesn't have a lot of speed in the backcourt. So that's an advantage for Georgetown. So it, it balances sure. out. It's going to be good stuff. Hey, Jim Feist, speaking of uh, good stuff, the world champion handicapper Jim Feist, you see his number on the screen right now. And uh, Jim has his Tournament Dog of the Year going this weekend. It's part of his free package. Make sure and call that toll-free number that you're looking at right now and get the best there is from world champion hand handicapper Jim Feist. Uh, we're going to wrap it up. That's it. We're done. Uh, make sure and take advantage of the offers that we've got. And don't forget to visit Rotoplay to have some fun and uh, uh, get involved on the fantasy end of things. We are going to have our big baseball preview show, uh, which will be available next Friday. So ProLine is going to continue. Uh, as we uh, take a look at baseball in depth next week. Meantime, we'll uh, say enjoy the tournament, everybody. It's been a blast. Hope you're winning a lot of money. If you are, keep it going. If you're not, make sure and take advantage of somebody who is because we're all going really well right now uh, here on the panel. For Scott Sprite, Glenn McGrew, and for Jim Feist, the guys behind the scenes, I'm Dave Koken. Enjoy the action at the Sweet 16, everybody. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks for watching us this week, and be sure to catch ProLine on the web next weekend, available Friday nights for more great insight.